So now, Mr. Brock Dolman, he uh, gave an amazing talk. I mean, he's done, what, how many permaculture trainings have you done? You said the other day. Too many, 90 or 90, 90 permaculture trainings from Occidental Arts and Ecology. Um, gave an incredible talk on water. Uh, water's kind of his specialty, but uh, he gave the keynote this year at EcoFarm this last January, and I said, you know, we've got to have that at our conference. So we haven't interacted as much together, but this is uh, fantastic to have you here. So take it away. Thanks, man. Oh. Everybody needs a mic. And after Chris is giving me the mic, give it up for Chris, because he's just been so busy in this conference. It's amazing. <clears throat> I love watching him facilitate sessions. He's got so many great questions, and you're just really on target. So, whoo, oh, my goodness. Hi, y'all. On cleanup here, I was saying, I'm, you know, when your bases are loaded and you get to swing for the fence, but with you all, at least there's movable fences. So hitting a home run out of the park might not be as far on this one. So, um well, I am so uh, honored and happy to be here, and it's, I've been here since Friday with y'all and just witnessing all the amazing work, and, and it's a pleasure to be around Alan a bit more and, and, and such. And so I, uh, Chris asked me to, you know, put together a bunch of images, and I think to some degree I uh, freely shall admit I'm not trained in holistic management. I don't have my certificate and such, so I'm a poser in that regard at this moment. But I kind of assembled a bunch of images and things around thinking about water in larger scale context and then a, a smattering of resources and ideas and thoughts for you. So thinking ultimately about the idea of rain fed versus grain fed and what is range land with an R-A-I-N there. So I live and work at this Occidental Arts and Ecology Center. We're a small little nonprofit in western Sonoma County. We do lots of things and you can check us out, but we're a demonstration farm. We're an intentional community. There's 10 of us that co-own the place together. This is our 21st year of doing so. So it's, a, it's a, as an intentional community, a, a collective group of people, if you will. It's a glorified hippie commune. We just have shorter hair and better lawyers than they did 40 years ago. Um, <clears throat> I was joking with Michael out there at, the, at Chelsea Green selling the book there. We do have a cookbook for sale here. In this case, the cookbook is primarily a, a vegetarian cookbook, and he was laughing about how hard it is to sell the book at a, at a conference like this one. So anonymously, I did hear that um, this book should be billed as the Extraordinary Organic Side Dish Cookbook, loaded with perfect pairings for your savory, salt rub, tasteful, and nutrient-dense grass-finished steak. So think about it in that regard, because you don't need a cookbook for a steak. You just put salt on it, as we heard from Nicolette the other day. So one of the programs I run there is called the Water Institute with Kate Lundquist, and water is an acronym for Watershed Advocacy Training, Education, and Research. And I want to get a little bit into that. But just by way of, of background, my dad's a retired colonel in the Marines, and I spent my young years growing up in, in, uh, in Okinawa in Japan while he was doing three tours in Vietnam there, so back in June of 68. And, and I guess my, my interest is I have a, my double major in agroecology and conservation biology out of UC Santa Cruz. And so the pursuit of tadpoles in a rice paddy kind of gave me a sense around that relationship of being a wildlife biologist in an agricultural ecosystem there that was aquatic. So I'm a biophiliac. And then for the folks that come from the UK, you have a good, pretty good sense about that the brock, what brock means in, in the old English and such. And I figured with a, a, a group of folks here focused on grasslands and things, you would get a sense that Brock is the old English word for a badger. So I'm a bit, I've been accused of being a bit of a badger and an American badger, and these guys don't get enough love. They're a keystone species, and they're feisty, though, if you poke one with a stick, which it feels to me like a lot of you all are similarly that way. Um, so I am a wildlife biologist, mostly by focus, and spent a lot of time working in doing environmental impact reports on endangered species and organisms that were at the brink of extinction. And what at some point became clear to me is that when human land use practices had compromised the very cycles upon which life was dependent, such as the water cycle or the carbon cycle, the carrying capacity for life was accordingly compromised. And, and it made me wonder a lot about human settlement. Are, why are we so, are we antibiotic or probiotic? What, what is this against life fixation that appears to be happening to the degree that we are actually in the great sixth extinction wave right now, subsequent to 65 million years ago in this asteroid? And so my, I'm really interested in a movement that is basically a, uh oh, that guy didn't show up, should say pro-life, a pro-life movement. I understand, there we go. I understand what pro-life in an American context means, but this is a pro-life of all species of all generations for all time, and then we can argue about unborn hominids. But how do we really reclaim that right relationship? And for me, one of the founding 
reality checks is to get clear that this being over here on the left of your screen, that's not planet Earth, that's planet water. Right? 70% of the surface of this living, breathing, Gaianistic orb here, as much as there's a discussion about terrestrial carbon sequestration, 70% of the surface of this is aquatic and it's saline. And so you really do live on planet water. And the coolest thing about planet water is, is it's the only place in the known universe where life is endemic. Right? Endemic, which we think about native plants on serpentine slopes in California being that they only occur there. But unless somebody else can hook me up with an extraterrestrial right now that you can confirm is indeed the case, life is endemic to this planet. It only occurs here. It's this amazing miracle. And as a biologist, I certainly am not interested in going to that other little place over there called the moon. I heard they found some frozen water on the dark side of the moon. The idea of inhabiting the moon because there's frozen water there is for why would a biologist go to a lifeless place? And The Dark Side of the Moon was a much better album name by Pink Floyd than it is a place to colonize, as far as I can tell. And the interesting thing is, and by full admittance here, I'm completely behind the idea of nuclear power desalinization for water supply. It's, I kind of think it's the only way to go. I want one nuke plant 93 million miles away. It's a big thing called the sun, and I want it desalinating the ocean and running something called the hydrologic cycle. Right? <clears throat> And then our, our game is, and I think to, to Alan's point with HM there, is how do we make effective that annual contribution that Gaia gives you on a planet where the hydrologic cycle is inequitably distributed and seasonally uh, uh, avaricious. And in this, these drought years or these drying years, it's challenging for us in California. So the interesting thing is the total volume of water on planet water for the past four billion years has basically been finite. So you can think of it as the noun, the thing of water, is finite. But because it's a solar-powered desalinization cycle, actually the verb is infinite. Again, you don't, each year it may be different one way or another, but I'm really interested in supporting people and thinking more about verbs or in addition to nouns, thinking of as process-based ideas, and then also getting clear that by volume, every living organism on the planet, by volume, is mostly water. Our central atom is carbon, fair enough, but when we're actually actively respiring and metabolizing as a living organism, by volume, you're mostly water, and death is a function of dehydration. And the older you get, the less by volume water you are, and therefore, I would propose a toast that you all stay hydrated at this moment, right? Being lodrated is a bad thing for people and planets. So to the extent that you believe you're going to cast your lot with your future water security that will be delivered to you in a plastic bottle by some multinational corporation that's privatized somebody else's spring somewhere else and shipped it to you in a box, in a bottle, that is then going to be used and end up in an ocean gyre out somewhere in the Pacific, if that's your case, I would support you in recognizing you're a little bit, you know, you... <clears throat> Right, that might be a bottle shock at this point in time, but the deal is, is that we have to think like a watershed and, and reckon with the realization from ridgeline to river mouth to reef, we have to come up with a, a, a resilience in that relationship with the system and then come up with a framework for decision making that might help us think about how we're going to inhabit this landscape at a watershed scale or a regional scale or a continental scale or ultimately a planetary scale. And so in really looking at images like this, being, having been a whitewater kayaker for years, I recognize the noun in that image, but I recognize the verb there. But at some point, the biologist recognizes in me, to paraphrase Jacques Cousteau, that basically the water cycle and the life cycle are the same cycle. And, and the fact that life is endemic to planet water, I think, is indicative of that fact. A good friend of mine, if anyone's read this book, uh, Totem Salmon by Freeman House, this idea that the first thing we learned from salmon was the importance of the watershed as a unit of perception. And I, and I, I can get on board with that beyond just the poetics of, of the idea of perception at a landscape level, but at some point in reality, the work of the day is about perceptual change. And the unit of perception that's got to get that change is actually this one. It starts in the headwaters, which is the water on our own head. Right? We have to mitigate cerebral imperviousness to infiltrate the information, ultimately in the head and the hands and the heart. And so the work I'm ultimately interested in is what I refer to as ecosystem restoration. <laughs> right? Because doing ecosystem restoration is quaint, but until the ecosystem gets a new storyline that the planet's a community and not a commodity, and we're a part of it, not apart from it, it's going to be a rough go. And I think the, the data's pretty much in about the, the fallacy around our, our 
uh, anthropocentric perception on this thing. So I've been working for years, and I used to do uh, community-based watershed trainings. I called them basins of relations, and, and would work with folks who lived within a watershed and wherever they lived and, and come together on behalf of your shared basin of relations. And, and ultimately, that work led to doing workshops and speaking a lot. I ultimately feel like I'm a watershed therapist more than a biologist these days. And I'm interested if folks actually do know where their watershed is tonight. And, but at some level, in thinking like a watershed, if we're going to do that work, we actually have to engage in all of the supposed members, if you will, within that shared community, the, the relationships we have within the basins. And so we always call that a multi-stakeholder process. But as far as I can tell with you guys, it appears that this is a multi-stakeholder process. Right? Like how, many, how many stakes can you actually hold here? You gotta... No, that's terrible. Um, <clears throat> If anyone doesn't know Luna Leopold, he'd be worth studying if you're interested in the modern science of fluvial geomorphology. And he's the son of Aldo Leopold, fluvial flow, geo, earth, morphology, shape. It's the, those cast of characters that look at, at river dynamics and floodplains and, and, and erosional processes and deposition. But this idea that the health of our waters is the principal measure of how we live on the land is, is really interesting. And, and, and I know we've been talking a lot about soil and soil carbon, and, and we're going to come back to soil a bit here, but I think there's something about water, the quantity and quality of water in a place over time, that is a direct indicator or benchmark about the efficacy of settlement in place through time. And so the idea that if you are willing to believe my thesis here that you live on planet water, then I would, I guess I wonder, <clears throat> is the health of is the health of the waters on planet water a principal measure about how well we've been living on the planet? And you all tell me, how, how do you think the planet's doing right now with, with our, our uh, fallacious fossil fool fetish, right? This fixation on the oligarchy here. And at some point, you don't even have to listen to the scientists to tell you that something's up, right? It's pretty, it's pretty evident out there. <clears throat> I can tell you in 2015, the naked truth of the matter is that is the, the game is on. And, and whether we've aired our dirty laundry or our clean laundry here, the planet's running a fever. And it's, and it's not that complicated. The physics aren't that complicated about these heat-trapping gases for that a, an anthropogenic amplification, if you will, of a process of the greenhouse effect that has led to something that is generally now called global warming, and therefore climates are changing to adapt to this increase in the retention of heat. And if, you, if anyone's ever had a good fever, anyone had a really good fever, like malaria in the Amazon of Ecuador for weeks at a time, oh. And you get heat, but you get chills, right? And it's that back and forth swing. And so that makes sense. And then when you really look at some of the typical types of statements that come out of the IPCC, this Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, what you'll find there is that the extent to which human influence is detected in the warming of the atmosphere and the ocean these changes in the global water cycle, the reductions in snow and ice, and this global mean sea level rise, and ocean acidification is not even on there, every fundamental indicator at any meta scale is a water-based indicator. Because if you're running a fever, how are you going to break that fever? What is your body going to do? It's going to sweat, and it's going to attempt to change that liquid to a gas as a cooling reaction, or somebody's going to rub an ice cube on your forehead. So every scrap of solid on the planet is going to start melting off to run the swamp cooler. The endangered phase state of water is solid, right? And then we're going to move the liquid to vapor as fast as we can. And, and that's a a fascinating thing. And also you notice it says global mean sea level rise. It doesn't say global nice sea level rise because when sea level comes up, it ain't going to be nice. And this is a really big deal on this planet. So when you look at this stuff like the polar vortex or the ridiculously resilient ridge, this high pressure that's been parked off of the, off of the eastern Pacific here along the coast and has set this scene up where the jet stream has been bounced up and and heated up Alaska, and then it picks up that cold air, and then they get snowmageddon in Atlanta, and you get knuckleheads in the U.S. Congress who are willing to hold up a snowball in D.C. and complain about what global warming because it's snowing in D.C. And you're like, really? Really? How did, how did people get elected that way? Um, but these things are related, and that's what I think when systems thinkers get a better sense about how it is that... that California's drought, the West Coast drought, or dryness trend, to the earlier discussion that, or yesterday's panel with Courtney um, about dryness, and, and, snow, and the snow on the East Coast. And so 
For me, trying to figure this out as someone who pays attention to chemistry and thermodynamics, I'll let you stare at this slide a little bit here that I've tried to put together, but when you rearrange the magic Mickey Mouse molecule, these two hydrogen atoms stuck together onto one oxygen with plus charges and negative charges, and when you restructure that phase state from a solid to a liquid, the process of doing that requires energy, so it's a cooling reaction endothermic. And then the process of going from liquid to vapor as a cooling reaction. And you all get that. So it should be no wonder that the phase state change of what we're witnessing on all of the um, hydrologic cycles on the planet are, are, are basically working on a cooling trend to try to break this fever. I don't think the physics are hard. The politics about what we do about <laughs> adapting this reality um, Thanks, Tom and Kat, for <laughs> stepping up to that game. So at some level, I'm always interested at, well, what is sustainability? I hear the word a lot. And as far as I can tell, it's got to ultimately be about our ability to sustain the cycles of life. And at some point when somebody's telling me that, I'm like, okay, well, what are you sustaining? What, what's your goal? What's your holistic goal to sustain here? And the first one has got to be a reconnection of how it is this miracle of things called sunlight into sugar into soil. This crazy process where these little cyanobacteria became endosymbionts into algae and plants and chlorophyll and hooked it up such that they could make sugar out of sunlight. Are you kidding me? This is unbelievable. This reaction here, and this is a ta tattoo on my friend Austin's arm here, which I totally appreciate. That's a commitment right there. I appreciate that, Tat. Um, to go there to add light energy and chlorophyll and make plants and carbon and sugar and humus is one of the great, great things of all. It's one of the great miracles. And then the biologist to me, ultimately, if I'm going to really drill it down to which cycles I'm going to really pay attention to, I'm going to pay attention to carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen because those four atoms and the molecules that they dominantly comprise functionally are 96% of all living tissues on life. And so start with those. There's some other crazy elements there, but start with those if, you're, if you need a framework for uh, mitigating complexity. And then this all conspires, and we get sun, and we get sugar, and we get water, and we get geology with sand and silts and clays, and then we get life and bacteria and fungus and large and small animals, and we make this amazing thing called soil. That's incredible. Soil is, is an amazing thing. Soil structure, living soil structure. And so what is it to be effective and pro-life? And it's really, I think, about these keystone processes. Not keystone species, but keystone processes. Earth, air, fire, and water create conditions conducive for life. And we've got to figure that one out to honor what really is organic, by definition, carbon-based organic living soil as an ecosystem. And, and then basically... What I'm interested in, because I love dung beetles, is, you know, how can we most effectively roll, right? I want to get on a roll with a dung beetle. Imagine these characters. They're so amazing. They can take that little dung and just push it down in that hole, and it's like these acupuncture needles. They're just pushing carbon down there. But I'm often, ultimately, as a life literacy coach, I'm interested in life literate landscapes. How do we do ecological emulation of life literate landscapes? And you got to keep the dirt out the crick, people. Like the, the idea of that we um, allow so much soil in the northern Pacific Northwest here, the single largest pollutant in our waterways is soil from a whole suite of land uses out there. And so I appreciate this quote from R. Dixon back in 1937, this idea that don't pray for rain if you can't take care of what you get. And there's a whole lot of discussion about a big El Nino year coming to California. And I'm like, ah. It's going to be a bunch of brown, muddy cricks and landslides if we get a whole bunch of rain, too. So we need to pattern the landscape so it more effectively can handle that gift of Gaia when she gives it to us. And, and I think Betsy Damon here, a friend, I, I appreciate her quote about that water is the foundation of life and must also be the foundation of design in the built environment. So as a designer, my first question usually is what would water want in quantity and quality? That's, for me, a, 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 con a contextual, holistic goal, if you will. And then I've worked a lot at trying to retrofit people's thinking of moving away from the drain age to the retain age so that stormwater is not a problem that you plow and pipe and pave and pollute and plunder from. We have to figure out how to slow it and spread it and sink it and store it and share it and savor it. And ultimately, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a social spiritual conundrum more than a technical conundrum. 
So there's a number of documents out there, and you can find these online. This one's Slow It, Spread It, Sink It, Store It guide is out there. I do lots of different scales, and we look at roof water harvesting. This is a really simple system, just taking a, a flexible drain pipe and slicing it and putting it on a, on a shed roof with a um, steel roof there and catching water, in this case, gravity fed to my chickens and goats with a float valve there on a system. And then this is a dairy in the town of Bodega in western Sonoma County that has a 240,000 gallon underground roof water tank. That's all the water for this dairy replacement operation. They're 100% out of the stream for their water. They've done riparian fencing. And then they're also mitigating the runoff from the dairy roof, which used to contribute lots of sediment. And there's too much cow poo in the creek. And now they've restored flows for coho salmon while he has cleaner water, healthier cows, lower vet bills. And he's part of his uh, process to go organic certified in the dairy process, right? So we can do that. At some point, I support all of you in realizing you, we need to uh, fix up your roads. As Danny Hagens would say, nothing in nature mimics a road. And in your holistic goal, you've got to get your roads to be hydrologically invisible. At OEC, we've worked a lot on, and we just put out a 200-page plan, our stewardship plan, and we've got a whole bunch of soil, water, fire, life, educational, economic, resilient landscape goals there. For the Californian folks who are dealing with coastal prairies, I would reference you to this amazing website a bunch of us put together with the Sonoma Marin Coastal Prairie Working Group. Lots and lots of information in there that's really fun. One of the things I really trip on, though, about coastal prairies is the megafauna. And we have this incredible megafauna in our Bay Area. And Breck Parkman's written a lot about the California Serengeti. And as it turned out, two weeks ago, I found these stones in the woods at OAC that have the perfect rubbing rocks. And I have mastodon rubbing rocks up in, the, in the, our little piece of property in Occidental that are 25, 50,000 year old short faced bears wiggling their booty on the back end of that thing. Ground sloths, maybe zebras, camels. Like that inspires me when I'm thinking about future land management to imagine a ground sloth on that property. And how, is, how can goats and sheep and cattle become my ground sloth mimic? Another organization I work, I'm on the board of is Sonoma Mountain Institute. We manage a couple thousand acres, a thousand we own and a thousand we lease and do planned grazing on those properties in mostly Sonoma County. And, and uh, Nate Chisholm here and, and Byron Palmer, the folks who run that operation, we don't own any cattle there. We just bring them in. They weigh them before and after and move them around and deal with head-high thistles and and then really dry systems there. And then Mediterranean climate at the edge of the Pacific rainforest is a dynamic place to be managing cattle, as far as I can tell. Star thistle, one of the lovely plants we all deal with a lot. And I know it would appear that some of y'all are basically married to the mob, and I get that. But I'm, hopefully that, I'm hoping that you're basically at least going to just keep steering it in the right direction here, you know? <clears throat> OK. Go look at CalCan the California Climate and Agriculture Network to look at how we're going to take AB 32, Global Warming Solution Act money, and literally put that carbon in, in the back in the soil with agriculture. Um, and then I really do want to appreciate that Courtney White and the Kivera Coalition. I, I love the, the carbon ranch. And I think these, I, these visions about how to be effective are really based on the idea that planning is best done in advance, which is a novel idea. <laughs> so at some point, you know, I want to invoke my final critter here, which is none other than the beaver. Because while they, you might think they're a headache, and then if so, then take two aspen and call me in the morning about that one. Beaver are nature's engineers and architects. And, you know, not all dams or dam makers are created equally. And the damage of the dam age is not because of beavers. They're because of folks who like to put concrete in systems. And so look at the work of Glynis Hood here, who's done a lot of studies up in Canada, actually, looking at the idea that where... During the drought where beaver were present, there was 60% more open water than in that area where there weren't beaver previously. And so she really asserts that we're suffering from a beaver deficit disorder. And you know, you may feel like you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, but these Wyoming ranchers have been trying to get beavers for years now to help fix things back up. Because the ranchers in the Intermountain West that have beavers, have water, have sub-irrigated pastures and are in business, and the ones that don't are out of business. There's a whole bunch of folks in the U.S. right now looking at beaver as a climate adaptation mitigation tool. There's some carbon sequestration literature looking at beaver dams and how can we mitigate snow pack, snow level rise on this. And then finally, folks for quite a while have been looking at um, reintroducing beavers. And whether it's in the 1950s with these little beaver snuggle fest, little party here, and that's just the cutest little scene there, like a picnic. I love ranchers snuggling beavers there. Um, 
<clears throat> but you know, in Idaho, they, they dropped beavers into the wilderness out of parachutes and had lovely Geronimo the beaver. And then California wouldn't be outdone, so in 1950, we were hucking beavers out of planes and parachutes into the El Dorado wilderness. So, you know, think out of the box here, but when the box lands, let the beaver get out, right? <laughs> it's kind of the deal. And so we've been working a lot with uh, arid western ranchers and folks and looking at beaver as a, as a beneficial tool. So we think bovine and beavers and casters and cows are collaborative comrades for cash carbon in a convivial community, right? So imagine Dixie Creek over a period of, of 30 years from dry to wet or Maggie Creek here where they've actually got piezometers looking at groundwater infiltration rates over 25 years with the arrival of beavers or these uh, Susie Creek images there from 92 to 99 to 2012. And the presence of these actual beavers that are herbivores that are managing water and trees and vegetation is something I would support those of you Western um, land managers to be engaged with as part of your planned grazing regime. And then get on board with the idea that, we, as I would say, we fight incision with incisors. And so sink your teeth into this issue. Um, We've done a lot of work in California, if you want to look at the historic range of beaver that we've expanded with our papers. And we ultimately believe that we need a new flag in California because the grizzly's been extinct. And so the question is, is are you part of the solution or part of the precipitate? It's kind of up, you, up to you to tell me that. But step forward, speak truth to power, and if that's a, a hot day in Santa Rosa with a foam salmon suit on, then wear shorts so you're not sweating too hard there. And at some level, my conservation hydrology idea would be how do we adapt our water footprint towards a regenerative, rehydrative, receiving, recharging, retaining, releasing, reverential, resilient retrofit for a rehydration revolution. And at some point, if you want to go fast, go alone. And if you want to go far, go together. And as far as I can tell, you holistic managers are go far together kind of people. So I thank you for your time and 